So I am very privileged to be here at the um, my PBM masterclass. And uh, as was mentioned, I'll be talking on meticulous hemostasis and surgical techniques. But let me start uh, with declaring that I have no disclosures. Sometimes I wish I had. And these are the uh, topics we'll go through in this presentation, the definitions and history, PBM and bloodless surgery, meticulous surgery and surgical techniques, the future, and then the conclusion. Right, so, but first let me mention where I'm coming from. I, I work in University of Calabar Teaching Hospital, which is a 500 bed tertiary health institution uh, where medical students, allied health workers, residents are trained. The significant thing about University of Calabar Teaching Hospital is that we have a multidisciplinary bloodless medicine and surgery uh, team. I am also a member of the Society for the Advancement of Blood Management which is where I learned a lot of what I'm practicing. I am certified in uh, fundamentals of PBM and also in the advanced concepts by the uh, society, the SABM. I am also certified in bloodless medicine and surgery in Englewood uh, Hospital and Medical Center and recently at uh, MedStar Health uh, in 2019. I am also a member of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society and currently serving as the president. So we want to talk about meticulous hemostasis and surgical techniques. Let's start with definitions and history. So by definition, uh, Dolan's Medical Illustrated Dictionaries says that hemostasis uh, is the arrest of bleeding either by the physiological properties of vessel constriction and coagulation, Sorry, let me do something about the, okay, the, uh, the videos, okay. So either by the physiological properties of vessel constriction and coagulation or by surgical means. There is a second definition that we rarely think about and that is the interruption of blood flow through a vessel uh, or to a part, usually uh, due to a pathology like a plaque. So we are not talking about that uh, second definition today. And as for the physiological properties of vessel constriction, all I can say about that is that it's a very elegant but complex process by which the body um, arrests bleeding whenever there's an injury. The only, well, the only other thing I would say is that we do manipulate some aspects of this coagulation cascade. Uh, for instance, when we give tranexamic acid uh, which is an antifibrinolytic in order to enhance hemostasis or other uh, agents that uh, work on some aspect of this coagulation cascade. Uh, fortunately, this is not the point of our discussion today. So uh, we're going to talk mainly about this surgical means of arresting uh, bleeding. So uh, surgical hemostasis actually has a very long history. The word hemostasis itself is Greek, from him meaning blood and stasis meaning halting. Far back uh, 1600 BC, there's, there's an ancient Egyptian literature that talks about tamponad uh, sutures and cautery. And in the first century AD, Celsus, who, who was a Roman, uh, talked about use of hemostasis, uh, hemostatic forceps. He reported that he used it. And Gallen is credited with introducing the concept of clamping a bleeding vessel with an instrument before tying it off. That was, again, far back in the second century AD. However, for about 14 centuries, the knowledge of surgical hemostasis appeared to have been lightly lost or forgotten. Maybe because the uh, uh, field of surgery was actually taken over by Barbers uh, who didn't have the opportunity to go to school and read all those uh, documents, ancient scripts about how people arrested hemostasis. So uh, Barbers just were interested in getting the job done fast, you know, uh, cutting and getting to where 
the problem is without bothering much about the most cases. Well, they were worried about it, but they didn't know how to stop it. So it was in the 16th century that the French barber surgeon Ambroise Paré uh, rediscovered hemostasis. He is the inventor of Bert de Corbin. Uh, forgive me if I don't pronounce it properly, those who are French. Um, so he invented this precursor of the uh, artery forceps, which is shown beside his picture here on the right. Jules Emile Pion in 1860s is credited with inventing the modern hemostat. That's the Pion again seen beside his picture. So uh, that's it's still called Pion by some till today, uh, the artery forceps. And Joseph Lister devised the technique for sterilizing cardboard also in the 1960s. In 1872, Emile Theodore Corker, a Swiss surgeon, performed his first thyroidectomy. Now that may be, it may not sound very remarkable today, but we need to note that just six years earlier in 1846, a notable surgeon, a Scottish surgeon, Robert Liston had said, you could not cut the thyroid gland out of the living body in its sound condition without risking the death of the patient from hemorrhage. And when hypertrophied, it is a proceeding by no means to be thought of. As a matter of fact, about that time in France, thyroidectomy was completely banned, was outlawed. But Cocker uh, did precisely what Liston said could not be done. He performed 5,000 thyroidectomies by the end of his career. With less than 1% mortality, he won the Nobel Prize in 1909. Now the textbook of surgery edited by uh, Sabiston says that Cocker's near perfect results were achieved by careful attention to control of blood loss, which is what we're talking about today, and the protection of the parathyroid glands. Careful attention to control of blood loss. That is meticulous hemostasis and surgical technique. Franz Nagelschmidt, a dermatologist from Berlin, introduced surgical diatomy in 1909. And the BOVI, or electric, electrosurgical instrument uh, that we use today, is uh, credited to William BOVI and Harvey Cushing, who uh, invented in 1928. Now, in 1900, Carl Lamsteiner discovered the ABO blood groups and subsequently the RH blood groups. And then in World War I, blood transfusion was widely used. And again in World War II, where they went further and were able to separate the red cells from the plasma, transfuse plasma and red cells. And after the World War, uh, the two World Wars, blood transfusion came into civilian medicine. It was just presumed to be safe and beneficial. There were no trials done to see how good it was. And sadly, it seems that once again, the skills of surgical hemostasis were apparently lost or forgotten. We, we relied mostly on blood in the back. But, uh, even when patient is bleeding, the question is, is, there, is the blood in the back? Yes, okay, don't worry, let's go. So that's, that was the attitude uh, that when in doubt, transfused. It was just in the 1990s that bloodless surgery, patient blood management and evidence-based medicine led to rediscovery, we can say, of the importance of meticulous surgical hemostasis. And um, we need to note that in 1988, for the first time, there was a serious challenge to the concept that blood transfusion is good. The National Institute of Health Consensus Conference on Perioperative Red Cell Blood uh, red blood cell transfusion challenged medical scientists to prove the efficacy of blood transfusion. And 20 years later, there was no evidence of efficacy and benefit. As written here in the current opinion in anesthesiology, the benefits of blood transfusion have never been conclusively demonstrated, but evidence of transfusion, transfusion related harm continues to accumulate. So blood transfusion was now found to be harmful. And this editorial 
in critical care medicine says, our analysis suggests that in adult intensive care unit trauma and surgical patients, RBC transfusions associated with increased morbidity and mortality. And the same year, 2008, new scientists wrote, the problem is not the much publicized risk of bloodborne infectious agents such as HIV, but the blood itself. I borrowed this slide from Dr. Victor Ferraris, a professor of thoracic surgery. He pointed out that blood transfusion in the operating room is bad, regardless of the type of surgery. For lack of time, I will not show his other slides, which demonstrate clearly that blood transfusion is associated with increased morbidity and mortality in a wide variety of patients, no matter how critically ill they are. And so this emeritus professor of surgery, Richard Spence, uh, titled this article he wrote in Author Supersight, Evidence-Based Medicine Reversing Long-Held Beliefs About Blood Transfusion, because we always believe that blood transfusion is the gift of life. It turns out that it might be the gift of death. This article in Transfusion Affairs and Sciences by Martin et al. says, recent evidence suggests that the application of bloodless surgery principles may result in improved blood, uh, sorry, improved patient outcomes, reduce morbidity and mortality, shorter hospital stays, significant overall cost savings in the health system. So while blood transfusion is seen to be associated with increased morbidity and mortality, Bloodless surgery is actually seen to be associated with improved outcomes. And this article again in 2008 in anesthesiology, December 2008, says patient blood management, a pragmatic solution for the problem with blood transfusion. So this was how we started thinking about this issue. Um, of uh, patient blood management and bloodless surgery as a way of improving outcomes, not just as a means of protecting patients' rights or for patients who object or decline uh, blood transfusion, but as a way of improving outcomes in all patients. So what's the relationship between uh, patient blood management and bloodless surgery and meticulous hemostasis and surgical techniques? I love this definition by Shanda and Waters in the American Society of Anesthesiologists newsletter of June 2011. Uh, it says, patient blood management is the application of evidence-based medical and surgical concepts aimed at relying on a patient's own blood rather than on donor blood and achieving better patient outcomes. So note, relying on a patient's own blood rather than donor blood. And again, it talks about the outcomes, achieving better outcomes. So uh, this is really a, an important aim now. And the Society for the Advancement of Blood Management is coming out with a new definition, which was announced at the annual meeting last month. Uh, it says patient blood management is a patient-centered, systematic, evidence-based approach to improve patient outcomes by managing and preserving a patient's own blood while promoting patient safety and empowerment. So again, note managing and preserving the patient's own blood. And note also the aspect of improving the patient's outcome. Now, let's compare with earlier definitions uh, of bloodless medicine. This one is from Transfusion 2003. It says, bloodless medicine refers to emerging clinical strategies for medical care without allogenic blood transfusion and is a well-defined area in blood management. So caring for patients without using donor blood. And this article about surgery, by Martin et al. in Transfusion and Apparency Science, defines bloodless surgery as a comprehensive perioperative approach that has as its goal allogenic transfusion avoidance with a view to improving patient outcomes. So again, it brings the issue of 
uh, avoiding allogenic blood transfusion and improving patient outcomes. And it says that in the same article about bloodless surgery, that it is a safe, effective team approach to medicine and surgery that reduces blood loss and uses the best available alternatives to allogenic transfusion therapy while focusing on the provision of the best possible medical care to all patients. So reducing blood loss, that's hemostasis. And uh, uh, using alternatives to allogenic transfusion and providing the best possible care. It's not substandard care, but quality care to all patients. So again, the concept is not just patients who decline blood transfusion, but all our patients can benefit from bloodless surgery. And this article, sorry, this chapter, it's a chapter in the book, Blood Transfusion in Clinical Practice. Uh, it defines bloodless medicine and surgery as the provision of quality healthcare to patients without the use of allogenic blood with the aim of improving outcome and protecting patients' rights. It involves the use of blood conservation techniques in combinations that are specific to the individual patient. So we, we see then the, in patient blood management, emphasis on relying on patients' own blood and also uh, rather than donor blood and also achieving better outcomes, which is similar to what we also see in bloodless medicine and surgery. So we can say that bloodless medicine and surgery is actually patient blood management at its best because all those uh, improved outcomes that we talk about in patient blood management also actually have to do with patients in whom no allogenic blood products were used. If once we introduce allogenic blood products, there are people who will tell you that there's no difference uh, when you use do patient blood management, there's actually no difference in outcomes. But when you compare with those that are not taking a blood transfusion at all, the difference is stark. So the uh, World Health Organization had actually adopted the uh, pillars of patient blood management in 2010 and said that uh, we bear in mind that patient blood management means that before surgery, every reasonable measure should be taken to optimize the patient's own blood volume, to minimize the patient's blood loss, and to harness and optimize patient-specific physiological tolerance of anemia. Uh, right. So we can see that the, uh, the pillars of patient blood management uh, are what we have been seeing, optimizing the hematocrit, minimizing blood loss, and supporting patient tolerance of anemia. We've been seeing it uh, in various journal publications and in the SABM uh, meetings. What about bloodless medicine and surgery? It's the same thing. Did you notice that nothing changed? The only thing that could change is that we have a third Right, so in bloodless surgery, is still optimizing the hematocrit, minimizing blood loss, supporting patient tolerance of anemia. But we do have a fourth, which is actually what we put as a third, optimizing tissue oxygenation. Now, out of these pillars, it is the second one we are talking about, that's minimizing blood loss. And there are several components, several techniques under that pillar, minimizing blood loss. Starting from taking a, a, a brief, a good history and physical examination to rule out those who might have bleeding disorders or are taking medication uh, that increase hemorrhage, uh, restricting phlebotomies, taking medication that minimizes hemorrhage, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are intraoperative uh, strategies. Again, quite a number of them. And the concept of patient blood management or bloodless surgery has to do with using as many techniques as, as possible under all the pillars. But we are today just talking about one of those uh, techniques here in minimizing blood loss as meticulous hemostasis and surgical techniques. So 
uh, the Cambridge Dictionary says that meticulous means very careful and with great attention to every detail. The truism that prevention is better than cure still applies here. So whenever possible, we should carry out preemptive hemostasis. We'll uh, describe that a little more. And we should use simple methods promptly. Don't wait, we use it immediately. Like pressure, packing, tamponade. Those are simple things that we should not ignore. And we should stop each hemorrhage before continuing the surgery and maintain a dry field. Because if we do not, when we encounter another bleeder, it will be more difficult to actually identify that bleeder and stop it because the whole field is bloody anyway. And take the time because hemostasis actually takes time. Now let's take a look at this uh, first one, the preemptive hemostasis. So we take some measures ahead of even the bleeding, ahead of even the, the actual knife on skin. We want to ensure normothermia, which can be a challenge in certain environments. Uh, the room temperature should be 27 degrees C and above. That's not a problem where I work because even with the air conditioner on, I think the room temperature is above this. Sometimes, depending on the environment, we need to warm the patient uh, using things like bear hogger and warm intravenous fluids. Positioning of the patient, we want the, right, uh, the OP site to be above the right atrium. So if we're doing a thyroidectomy, we put that patient in reverse trendelenburg. And if we're doing a hemorrhoidectomy, we put the patient in trendelenburg or as much as near trendelenburg. Of course, uh, for thyroidectomy, it can also be semi-sitting position and so on. We don't want to compress large vessels. So in obstetrics, we find that the patient's uh, placed a bit uh, to one side, uh, typically a bit to the to the left, and in uh, um, spinal surgery, they will put some blocks that the patient will lie on, so that the patient lying uh, um, prone would not compress the abdominal vessels and lead to increased hemorrhage. So positioning on its own can greatly reduce the, the hemorrhage in surgery. We do preemptive pharmacotherapy. For instance, tranexamic acid. We don't wait till the patient is bleeding before we give tranexamic acid. We give it ahead, sometimes one gram uh, before even knife on skin, about 500 to one gram. And then we, we usually, my own center, we'll put 500 milligrams in each uh, liter of fluid during surgery. So the patient might have about one or to three grams of tranexamic acid, and it cuts down drastically on the hemorrhage. We, we add vitamin K, not only for patients that uh, have liver problems, but for all our patients, we just give them a shot of vitamin K before surgery. And uh, you know, using all, all these agents before knife on skin, can greatly help. Even, even our protein in, uh, for cardiac surgery. We apply tonicates for limb surgeries whenever possible. For myomectomies, we apply tonicate also around the, the cervix to, uh, to cut off the uterine arteries. And we ligate as much as possible before transection of the vessel. So for thyroid surgery, we try to identify the thyroid vessels ahead, and then ligate them before we go on with the rest of the surgery uh, or, or transect them. Hemorrhoidal vessels, the same thing. Uh, many of our surgeons here will put sutures first around the uh, pedicle before they dissect the hemorrhoidal vessels. Splenic uh, vessels, renal vessels, and perforating vessels at mastectomy. So we can use the sutures, clips, or whatever to make sure that we get, get control of those vessels before ever we transfer them, then they will not bleed. Then we want to use available technology. So I'm putting this last because our emphasis is not on technology, but where it is available, we should use it. We should know how to use it and use it well. Whether we have diathermies, harmonic scalpel, 
uh, cavitron, ultrasonic surgical aspirator, plasma jet, water jet, laser, ligation, equalization. You should use them appropriately um, whenever they are available. So now the simple methods, some of them can be actually definitive or they might be the temporizing measures before definitive ligation or hemostasis. Things like pressure, applying pressure, uh, packing. We can, I mean, if we see a patient that is bleeding from a leg following trauma, simple pressure bandaging might be what the patient needs. At surgery, just putting a finger, a finger pressure on the bleeding spot while we um, clean or, or dry up the area and find the actual bleeder and uh, um, ligate it. It can be life-saving. Uh, Pringles maneuver, liver surgery, various other maneuvers, depending on the kind of surgeries that are being done. Sometimes you just need to pack a, a site that is oozing. You can pack it, first of all before we go on to think of what else to do, whether we're going to use the topical hemostats or adrenaline pack or what. And after hemorrhoidectomy, we usually would put an, an inner pack so that there will be no uh, further hemorrhage. Now we want to take the time, it's still talking about being meticulous, to, be, to do meticulous surgery, it takes time. Of course, faster surgery may result in less blood loss, but we must balance that with careful surgery. Note that one of the fastest surgeons in history was Robert Liston, who it was said could do an amputation within 28 seconds. Remember, he was one that doubted uh, or thought that nobody could ever do a thyroidectomy on an enlarged thyroid. And sadly, he was also the only surgeon to ever record 300% mortality. How did he do that? So in his speed in amputation one day, he not only chopped off the patient's leg, he chopped off the assistant's finger. And uh, when he brought his knife back up, it grazed somebody else who collapsed in shock and eventually died. And the other two died from infection. So we don't want to, uh, of course, we won't get to do that, but the point is that meticulous surgery takes time and we have to be ready to take that time. Some, uh, some special surgical techniques can help us with hemostasis, like laparoscopic and robotic surgery is associated with less hemorrhage. That's one of the great selling points. Uh, there's the, it's possible to see the tissue in detail and more easily uh, ligate bleeders and of course, the access is through not a large incision, but a small one, which would lead to less hemorrhage. So where we are able to make use of it, we should try to use it. Interventional radiology can offer definitive therapy in some situations, like offer GI bleeding. And sometimes it can also help to embolize a default bleeder at surgery, where such facilities exist for uh, easy deployment. Some techniques are peculiar to some surgeries and help. Uh, instances are like the off pump cardiac surgery, the B linked suture in postpartum hemorrhage. Those are uh, special surgical techniques. There are others in other areas. And we should not hesitate to call in more experienced surgeons when necessary or refer. Where it is uh, difficult surgery, like we, we, we would, we're not going to start just because we are very knowledgeable in bloodless surgery, we won't go and start doing a Whipple's uh, procedure as the first time. No, we want to send to a surgeon that is familiar with that procedure uh, where we anticipate challenges that we may not be able to handle. So we can then um, have a better outcome. So let's uh, say a little about the role of technology. Obviously, it has a role in surgical hemostasis from surgical diatomy to robotic surgery. However, we want to stress that education is key to successful patient blood management, not technology. Remember that Emil Theodor Koka, who uh, defied the assumption of Robert Liston 
and got a Nobel Prize. He didn't have all this technology, he had very limited technology. His success is credited to meticulous hemostasis and a good surgical technique, which was founded on uh, scientific knowledge, knowledge of anatomy, and uh, being ready to take the time to, to carry out the surgery safely with adequate hemostasis. How important is meticulous hemostasis in patient blood management and bloodless surgery? You can see here in this article by Goodenough, Shanda, and Spence, they credited intraoperative meticulous hemostasis and uh, operative technique with saving up to one or more units of blood. So that is significant and it can really make the difference between a good outcome and a bad outcome. So in summary, um, benef uh, the benefits of bloodless surgery are patient blood management. Sorry. My screen sharing is paused. Resume share. Okay. Oh, wow. So in summary, um, we can avoid hazards of blood transfusion, avoid adverse outcomes of blood transfusion by using bloodless surgery or patient blood management. Our patients will recover faster with lower morbidity, shorter hospital stay, lower mortality, better patient satisfaction. And of course, we ourselves, the healthcare team, will have better satisfaction. Nobody wants this patient to be lying there sick or dying. Above all, it's evidence-based, as you can see uh, earlier. So where do we go from here? Uh, actually, the future is here. There are more and more innovations in this area. It has brought in so many innovations, newer plasma jet um, devices, newer topical hemostats, coagulation factor concentrates and recombinant factors instead of using whole blood, uh, fresh frozen plasma, or even cryoprecipitates, we're having recombinant factors now. And we have mentioned robotic surgery and interventional radiology techniques are advancing. There are artificial blood substitutes that are not necessarily oxygen carriers, but which improve oxygenation, as we heard from the last speaker, uh, Dr. Ola, who has been working with Dr. Shanda uh, with OxyLife which was uh, Dr. Ola's idea. So often we're thinking, oh, if it doesn't have red blood cells inside, or if it doesn't carry oxygen, it cannot improve things. Of course, they can improve. Those, those uh, fluids, uh, they can improve things. And they, you see, they are even featured in a recent uh, anesthesiology journal talking about future, the future of uh, blood management. So in conclusion, minimizing blood loss at surgery is an important pillar of patient blood management and bloodless surgery. Meticulous hemosis is, is critical in minimizing blood loss at surgery. And several surgical techniques exist today for effective uh, hemostasis. Now, blood transfusion is clearly associated with adverse outcomes, whereas patient blood management and bloodless care are associated with lower morbidity and lower mortality. And, uh, right, so I'd like to acknowledge, sorry, I don't know what happened there. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the organizing committee of this masterclass, Nanti, Dr. Sata, Dr. Ferraris, Shelley Moore, the Society for Advancement of Blood Management, the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society, uh, my own Bloodless Medicine and Surgery group in my institution, and uh, all others who have contributed and helped me with this talk. Thank you very much. Yes, this is the, the first part of the survey is about the profession of the people who registered for this meeting. Thanks all the participants who registered for the meeting. 
uh, based on the survey, majority of them are medical doctor, about 70% are medical doctor, about about the 13% are paramedic staff and others are about 16%. So also most of the doctors are medical doc officer, about 45.4%. Another about 36% are specialists of the medical specialists of different type and also there are many trainee who are participating 13.4% and another about 10% are the housemen who take part in this meeting. And the practitioner type of the people who take part in this meeting, the largest group is the anesthesiology department staff. The next is the ONG, about 23.8%. And the other two groups are surgical based discipline and also the medical based specialists. The, out of the number of the participants, about 76% are coming from government organization. Then the other two groups are from private organization, which about 10% and slightly more higher percentage for the university. So the next part of the survey is about the knowledge and the practice of the people who take part in this meeting. <clears throat> the first question asked about the participant is that, have you heard about the patient blood management? Yes, nearly 70% of them have heard about the patient blood management which is the good news. Most of them know what is PBM. Also, this will make a bit smaller here. Make a bit smaller, a bit smaller a bit. The, the PBM focus, what is the view of the participants? And most of them feel that the main things of the PBN is blood product management. And the second important thing is individual patient management and also a small group thing that healthcare system management may be important. So, so, what is the view of the people that all the patients going for limb, spine, abdominal, cardiac, ONG, neuro, surgery, do they need group and cross mesh blood, two units of blood ready? <clears throat> Luckily, majority think that not necessary, nearly about 57% think that that is not necessary. Only 43% think that group and cross mesh for two units of blood is important. Okay, the next thing is about the cost of the group and cross mesh. What is the view of the participants? So, the, about one third of them think that the cost should be about 50 to 100 ringgit. Another one third think that should be 100 to 200 ringgit. Another about one third thing that the cost should be about 250 to 1000 ringgit. Only about 10% think that the cost should be 10 to 30 ringgit for the blood and group and cross match. The reality of the group and currently all the price are subsidized by the government. That's why across cross in Malaysia is quite low. The next part is about the intraoperative patient blood management involved. What is the view of the participant? The first one is, is it an attentive strategy is important? Yes, 80% think that there's an important strategy. Second one is about careful, restrictive use of blood products. Yes, majority think that, 83% think that that is important. Also, timing of surgery once 
erythropoiesis optimized. Yes, that is actually important. Timing of surgery, patients should be optimized the blood before they do the surgery, unless it's emergency surgery. And next thing is about a blood conservation surgical technique and hemostasis. Yes, majorly feel that that is important. 86% of the patients say that. And maintenance of normal thermi, let me keep the temperature normal during the surgery. Definitely, that is important issue too. And a big group also think that that is important. Autologous blood strategy, that is acute normal volumic hemodilution cell salvage, which about 70% think that that is important. Blue and cross match, only 30% think that is important. Luckily, yes, that is the most, most important thing in reality. PBM, we don't need glue and cross match blood all the time. And also optimizing cardiopulmonary function, that is also important. That is about 68% of the participants feel that way too. And topical hemostate, 54% things important. In reality, probably it's a bit higher than that. And pre-op pre autologous donation, the only 48% think that that is important. In reality, there is maybe one of the strategy to decrease the usage of blood for other donors rather than use their own blood. <clears throat> so surgical reduction of blood loss is more dependent on which. Is it positive for sophisticated surgical equipment or surgeon skill? Luckily, most of the surveyor, about 90% think that surgeon skill is more important, not just a surgical equipment. I do believe not many surgical equipment can definitely reduce the blood loss. It's more like surgical technique that is more important. In the absence of equipment during bleed, what PBA measure can be done to manage stop bleeding? So, Majority think that apply manual pressure to organ and bleeding surface. Definitely, there is a good strategy. A lot of things, if you pack something, you compress the area of bleeding, you will definitely decrease the bleeding. The other next view is Messi's transfusion protocol activation. It may help a little bit. And the other possible use, use suction gauze or also, transfuse whole blood, those things, not very important. It may help a little bit. So, in the operating theater and the operative field, does temperature control play a part of the blood loss? Yes, almost 97% agree that that is important. That is definitely the right answer. Can I be Iron be given intraoperatively. Yeah, luckily, majority think that there is not a main strategy. About 36% say it may help, which I'm not sure. I never give that intraoperative iron. Yes, pre-op iron will be good and post-op iron. Other than intra-op, usually we don't give that. Can pre-op, peri-op, transamic acid reduce? Carry out blood loss and transfusion requirement. Yes, definitely. Transamic acid is a very good medicine to decrease the bleeding during the perioperative period. They will definitely decrease the blood loss and need the blood transfusion. A skillful surgeon and meticulous anesthetist bleed and transfuse patient less. Yes, definitely. It's a purpose surgical skill done and also more meticulous anesthetics definitely will help to decrease the blood loss and need the blood transfusion. Have you used and counter acute normal volumic hemodilution cell salvage? <clears throat> yes, uh, in a majority think that no, about 58% think that they don't use this uh, normal volumic hemodilation cell salvage. Acute normal volumic hemodilution and cell salvage are difficult to use and costly. Majority think that it's a cost that is higher, higher. That 
That is why the majority, about 60%, say that difficult to use because of cost. Challenges of using intraoperative patient blood management measure. Choose all the relevant ones. Most of them think that lack of knowledge and skill. There is a challenges. 91% think that there is a main challenges. Lack of knowledge and skill. That is why end up patient got more bleeding. The next is next lack of support from the colleague. That is true. Then sometimes you may do the right strategy, but if other colleagues not helping you, you it might still end up, you may end up use more blood and so on. And, and the lack of support of healthcare, that is also important thing. Other people help you, then you are definitely the, some of the challenges that to do the intraoperative patient blood management measure. And costly, yes, there is another challenge. Certain products and certain things also may increase the cost a little bit. Is intraoperative patient blood management worth pursuing? Yes, big majority think that that is important to do it. There is a good news. Hopefully, more people will do more intraoperative PBM during the surgery. Well, definitely, they will improve the outcome of the patient. Thank you very much for all of the participants to take part in the survey and also take part in the meeting. I do hope that with that, we improve our patient care in Malaysia to optimize our patient care during the perioperative period and intraoperative technique as well. That will definitely help our patient outcome.